What's up guys, Matty here from dclblogger.com. I haven't made a video for so long, it's probably been a good two, three weeks maybe, but been kind of slowing it down till I get a little bit more organized and get some more help because things have just been very wild. My messages and my DMs, emails have just gone a bit crazy. Anyway, getting back into the swing of things and wanted to go through a video talking about supply and demand and uh, marketplaces and NFTs. And at the core of all this NFT madness, from the tens of millions of dollars worth of, you know, a Beeple sale that happens for 70 million to something that doesn't sell at all, that probably sells, maybe sells a dollar or something. Um, you know, why are these prices so fluctuating? Um, how do you even value these things? And at the core of it all, um, if you really get, you know, the more you're kind of invested and the more you get experience with this space, you'll notice that at the bottom of it all is just supply and demand. A simple formula that sets the price for things, uh, no matter how high or how small they are. Um, there's also obviously emotional elements where, you know, how badly you want that. But, but if we're just looking at the numbers, we're going to just dive into supply and demand for now. So um, we can quickly look at the Beeple auction, right? This Beeple auction went for 70 million pretty much. And everyone, I'm sure, in the outside world was like, what the hell's going on? We wouldn't pay $2 for this image, right? We wouldn't even pay $100 for this image. Why are people paying for this at all? The reality is, at the end of the day, there was a, an X amount of people that wanted it. And so there was a demand from people that wanted it. Um, and it, w w however, it was perceived, right? Whether they thought that this piece was going to have tremendous value in the future, whether they thought that this piece um, is iconic because of the time and the idea behind the sale, right? Whether they loved Beeple, whether they, whatever was in their mind, that aside, the demand was from high caliber, high spending people. And so it sold for a price that the retail investor or someone like, you know, the common person would not really spend that much money, right? And 70 million, was it justified, right? Meta, Meta Coven ended up purchasing this and some people thought it was a bit weird because at the end of the day, you know, Meta Coven was the one that bought all the early edition pieces, that, that kind of was a big part of building the Beeple uh, crypto story, right? Obviously, Beeple was a big deal before this. Big respect to him. Um, but when when in crypto, like, um, Beeple blew up from the, from the single edition pieces as well. A lot of that had to do with Metacoven as well. Um, so it was a bit weird for people to think that Metacoven also purchased this. But at the end of the day, this was an auction that people battled it out for, right? So whatever the price was, if you wanted to own this, you had to spend and beat whatever the other person was bidding. So Justin Sun, he put this tweet out saying that he participated on the Christie's auction. And it's great that he put this out. My final effective bid was 60 mil plus, plus fee was 69 mil. However, was outbid by another buyer in the last 20 seconds by $250,000 difference. So he, so Metacoven at the time of buying that fought it out with Justin Sun, right? So there was demand there from two massive spenders um, and that's where the, why, why the price went to 70 mil. And it was a single edition piece. So it was only one of a kind of that piece. So the supply was one and the demand was high from high caliber people. You get a result like that. You see what I mean? So on a, on a smaller level or at a more kind of connectability level, you've got things like uh, Decentraland where... Um, you've got this marketplace of 45,000 land pieces. No, 90,000 land pieces. Um, I believe it's 150 to the, to the left, 150 to the right, or 150 in all directions. And each one of these was sold for like, you know, a thousand mana back in the day. Um, what's that? It used to be, when a mana was about 10 cents, it used to be $100, right? Now mana is $1.50, so even that is like $1,500. But um, now, if you go to any of these pieces, or you kind of list it by the cheapest, cheapest is four thousand two hundred mana, and also with mana going to a dollar fifty, you know that's like six thousand dollars plus. So you got a hundred dollars, and you got six thousand dollars plus. There's also some weird metrics with, um, you know, fluctuating currencies that we also keep in mind. The reason why I wanted to go through supply and demand is because it allows you to foresee problems. And opportunities. So, for example, if, all right, if it was, I think this is impossible to do, but if Lava Labs announced that they're going to add another thousand CryptoPunks, right? So, as far as I understand it, there's 10,000 CryptoPunks. 
Um, 1,000 of them were kept with the Lava Labs team. Now there's a bit less because they, they sold some back on the market. But if Lava Labs were to say, hey, we're just going to release our 1,000 pieces, the price would go down if the demand didn't keep up because now there's more supply. There's still 10,000 CryptoPunks. But if the Lava Labs team start to release that 1,000 supply into the wild, it's going to drop the price of the lowest down, right? Traditionally, that's how it works. But if the demand can keep up because, oh my God, there's this opportunity here to get some cool punks, people come in, that might keep it neutral or maybe even push it up. But when there's more supply added, generally speaking, the price goes down. So if Lava Labs were to say, hey, we're going to add another 5,000 crypto punks to these 10,000. So there's going to be now 10,000, 15,000 crypto punks. That's going to have big problems, right? Because First of all, I think it's impossible to do so because a contract, um, you know, was done four or five years ago. And so there was set at 10,000. And so I think if you, if you wanted to issue more, you'd have to issue a new contract. Maybe I'm not a technical guy, but I think that's how it works. But if hypothetically they came in and they said, we're going to release more, the price would go drastically lower. So why people invest in Lava Labs is because they know it's a set 10,000 pieces um, that there's going to be continuous demand that comes in that explore the NFT space and say, hey, this lava, this CryptoPunks thing was one of the first, if not the first. Um, well, it wasn't the first, actually. It was one of the first. And so the demand is going to keep increasing. And if the supply is set at 10,000, then that demand will continue to push the prices higher, right? But again, it, this kind of mentality allows you to see problems. So what normally happens, like I know some projects, you know, they had their set amount, but then they released more um they just released more into the wild and it kind of crushed the project because the early investors got got wrecked. Um, there was a, a project called MLB Crypto. I'm not sure if you guys remember. Um, I don't want to put them under the... Okay, well, what's going on here? Advanced. Let's proceed. Hopefully I don't get hacked. Oh. Well, it looks like they took down the site. But MLB, MLB Crypto was a um, kind of this... this Major League Baseball NFT game three years ago is actually one of the first and you could purchase these figurines and put them in fantasy sports locations and they would um, win more figurines, right? And that was a great concept and people would purchase, you know, some rare ones and you put them in different positions and they would earn more based on whether you won or if there was any cool plays. It was a great concept, but the problem was is that if you won more figurines, then if, if thousands of people are winning more figurines and those figurines are being added to the supply, then wouldn't that add the push the price down? Like if thousands and thousands of the same figurine of even a really rare one was trying to be was trying, rare ones were not becoming rare anymore because people were winning them. Right. So so what was happening was suddenly these went from being like twenty dollars a piece to like a dollar, even 50 cents a piece until like it just wasn't worth it. It was no it wasn't special to win these. Um, people were kind of using it as a way to earn money. They were like, oh, this is cool. But what people didn't understand or realize at the time was that this much supply being added was like eventually going to ruin the marketplace. So the supply and demand metrics for this project were a bit messed up. And that's what ultimately, in my opinion, led to the failure of this. Um, but those NFTs still exist and they can be you know, rejuvenated to start an MLB crypto again and with better metrics. But the reality is that the supply and demand there, from from my perspective, when I was watching and being part of it, and first of all, I don't know anything about Major League Baseball, but it was just fun to kind of put these and win and maybe sell them again. Um, yeah, you know, it was something that if I had foreseen, then I would have been like, I ain't touching these because, you know, you would have been able to see what was going to happen. And we also have obviously Nifty Gateway where um, they've got some some artists come and do their drops. And, you know, um, a lot of the early artists ended up doing really well. So, for example, if you were to see a lot of these artists end up, end up doing really well. But the ones that were really early before the whole blow up of the phase um, did, did exceptionally well because, at some, because their mints, the amount of minted tokens for their genesis was so low that, so for example, Josie, right? If you look at the Fed monkey series there's only like 21 of these there's only 21 of these um and high speed and the last one was 20k um if you go back again to josie forward together and you look at the cheapest 
or the most recent sell, last sold 2,600, last sold 20K. Um, any of these for sale? I'd love to own them. None for sale. The demand is so high that people aren't, the people that own them aren't even putting them for sale. But because the mints are so low, there's so much demand that's able to keep the, the price high. But then what happened was Nifty Gateway had the open edition thing, which blew up with Beeple, which is great um, because Beeple was one of the first one of the first to start that. But then everyone that came after, and then suddenly there was thousands and thousands of mints of the same thing. Well, if the demand didn't keep up, then those prices would go down. And that's why it's really important um, for me, and that's what I was doing with Nifty Gateway as well. I was just waiting to see if there was just too much mints. And if there was too much people minting, if the demand would keep up to keep the price at level. And then I just purchased what I have. Um, and now I think it's great. Um, there's still a lot of opportunity here, but it's more a long-term thing. It's, it's usually not to flip, although I'm sure people are doing good flipping as well. Um, if you go to CryptoArtPulse.com, which is our website, you can still see a ton of activity. All right, one minute, four minute, nine minute, 11 minutes. So there's a ton of sales going on from $300 to $2,000. People still spending a ton of money, but um, it's coming to a point, in my opinion, where I have to be a bit more conservative as to where I spend my money. So whether it's art or land, it's more of a, I need to be, I need to give it more of a focus plan. But for me, it's kind of good as well that the hype has died down a bit after the Beeple, Beeple $90 million, $70 million sale that it's a lot you know, it's going to put, bring the real collectors and stop the um, the flippers. And when that happens, again, mint love numbers slow down and they become collector pieces when the wave comes in again. So anyway, some some just basic comments on supply and demand. Um, and so the, when, I, when I launched the MetaKey, uh, if you guys have been checking out the MetaKey project, you know, one token, you can own any of these MetaKeys and I'm going to be integrating multiple perks or benefits, right? These benefits could look like anything. The, you know, you can be in Discord, and you know these are all these are all Medici Medici owners. So if you own the Medici, you can verify yourself in our Discord using um, a cool app that we use called Colab Land. And suddenly I can communicate to only Medici holders. So I'll be start adding like NFT announcements every time there's a new NFT project. Um, you know, just adding my advice or just having some discussions with people. And this is one of the many things I'll be doing with the NFT. Uh, with the MetaKey, right? I'll be integrating it in all of these partners. So as you can see, um, the MetaZone, which is a cool place where you can make buildings and deploy it onto your Decentraland land. I'll be making like a special set for MetaKey holders. Um, uh, you got the Meta Factory, you got Leet, which are merchandise companies. We'll be doing a special thing with them. Ethermon, which is a game in Decentraland. Neon District, which is also another game. Um, some influencers, some blogs, some more games in the sandbox. There's like an unlimited of things you can take it to games and it can become a sword or, or, or a cap or give you like a special bonus or an upgrade, allow you to fly. Basically, instead of like how people traditionally sold courses where it was just a one-time purchase of $400 and then that's it, right? You get the course. But in this case, you get an NFT, which is not only a course, which, you know, I'm making a video database as well for like NFT investors and NFT trading and all that as well. But you're also getting that same NFT I can integrate across everything else. So it's really cool that you, you don't just buy this. You don't just keep buying products or you don't just keep buying a course separately. Then you buy a Discord membership and then you buy, you know, a membership in a game. You just buy this one token that I will work to integrate into many things or whatever comes my way or the way of the meta key. So this, the idea for the meta key was to kind of flip the switch on supply and demand. So you got your Genesis set, which is 500, then you got edition two, edition three, but overall it's a macro unlimited cap. Anyone can buy the meta key at any time and join if they want to. It's not an exclusive club in, in the sense that there's only gonna be X amount, but the Genesis set only had 500. And if you look on Rarible, um, If you go to Rarible where you can buy these meta keys, then currently the second edition is still for sale. There's still, I think, 200 of them that, so there's 209 left of the 750. It's only been a week and we sold like a thousand altogether, including the first edition. There's only 209 of the Artifact Studios, but if you look at price, so it looks like the price of the meta key is going up. Um, on the first day we saw that many. Yes, because it's only locked at 500 and as this project continues to grow, then those Genesis pieces will become more and more valuable. 
You see what I mean? So it's kind of like a play on a bit of collectability value, which we're experimenting with, but it's more utility value. It's more like actually doing things with these tokens that you'll forever be able to do as long as you own any of these tokens or any of these, um, the meta keys. So, uh, but it's still, uh, you know, it's interesting to see the supply and demand um, dynamics at play. The current, I think the most recent sale, um, sales only sales sales so the most recent sale 0 0.8 two hours ago so the meta key itself has gone up in value like crazy I, I didn't even i wouldn't even think that i mean i haven't even rolled out like an integration yet and already people are you know the price is 4x the original meta key price which is crazy so it is interesting to me that um that's what's happening and, you know, just again, more commentary on supply and demand and how it works. But the MediKey is a really cool project to more kind of blend together a bit of collective value, the utility value, um, go big on both of them, combine them together and just see what happens. It's going to be a great project to keep in touch of and just to see whether you own a MediKey or not. But it will be cool to see how to, we integrate these things forward. Anyway, guys, <clears throat> I hope that's helped a little bit on supply and demand and given you some idea as to why things sell. Um, sometimes you go to Rarible and you see like 10,000 mints of an item, but because there's no demand, they're not selling. Um, and there's still that many left. So it gives you an idea why is something worth so much. It's usually because there's a lot of demand coming in. And so it also gives you, lastly, just very quickly, I wanted to go through this image, NFT Twitter hype cycle. Um, I made this post a while back and good old TSF Space Cowboy retweeted it again. And it's kind of like the NFT Twitter hype cycle, right? So early investors accumulate the early NFTs. Then the hype is high on Twitter. They show big sales and show big volume and the price goes up. And then they start selling for profit. The demand slows down. So less people want to buy it and the price is dropped. Volume really slows down and volume means how many people are buying and selling it. That, that drops the price even more. And then um, people kind of cruise along and the price is kind of stabilized and whether or not there's any utility or any value in continuing the demand later on when the next wave comes in it goes up if there's nothing special there's no utility there's nothing cool about it then the price normally goes down so that's why um you know lava labs or crypto punks has done well there's a lot of spin-offs of crypto punks which i'll be curious to see if they're going to do well or not it's kind of like well if you know crypto punks is only ten thousand, but it's the spin-offs where there's ten thousand plus ten thousand plus ten thousand plus ten thousand there's going to be millions of these NFTs that represent spin-offs, which ones and which ones, if any, and why will they become valuable and keep their value long term? You know, I'm, I'm a watcher in many of these things and just to see and observe how they kind of play out. But all right. Hope you guys understand that. You remember, like if any project kind of says that they're going to add more supply, be a little wary, make sure you know what's going on. If they're going to restrict supply, that's great. Um, it's also been a challenge for projects to continue onboarding new users past that first release because they don't want to dilute that initial users, but they want to keep going and obviously onboard new people and give them a cool value proposition. So when they join, there's fun things to do and they also get some collective value. Um, and also with Top Shots, same thing, right? All the early ones were really, really rare. The first Genesis release, they went up like crazy. Um, now the new ones are kind of, I'm not sure how they're doing, but I would assume they're not as good as the the first ones. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed that. Um, you know, share it and and like it on YouTube as you guys do. But uh, I'll be doing this much more frequently. Hopefully, every day. I'm trying to aim to do a YouTube video every day, um, probably starting from next week. But uh, yeah, see you guys in the, in the next video.